So, the hyacinth moment. In the first session, we walked with Janet, and she with us, in reconstructing some of the early experiences of her childhood and early adulthood. We considered her love of nature, her religious background, family deaths, and the beginning of her search for God, the search for her telos. And in this session, I want to focus on how she found it. And this is the, what we might call the hyacinth moment. Janet is already a Catholic and is working as a volunteer with a group of young women under the auspices of the Helpers of the Holy Souls religious congregation. She visits hospitals and workhouses and meets with the group every Monday afternoon for discussions, sewing and prayer. And you can read about what they got up to in the there's a 19th century biography of the life of Eugenie Smet, who had been a child at school with us in Lille, I think, and then went on to found the Congregation of the Helpers of the Holy Souls, as they now call themselves. Perhaps she is attracted to the order, to its outward-facing, useful work with the poor, and especially to its charism of offering up all the work it does as prayer for those who have died and who have not yet found their peace with God in heaven. There must have been some understanding that she was considering entering with them, as once she had made up her mind to enter with the society, she is said to have gone with tears in her eyes to see the superior and inform her that God was calling her elsewhere. On her way to one of the Monday afternoon meetings at the Helpers Convent in the northeast corner of Regent's Park, as it was then, she passes a flower bed packed with bedding plants in the Victorian style. The deep blue of hyacinth bulbs flowering en masse in a late spring. And I even looked up the weather reports for that year. And guess what? It was cold and wet. <laughs> she would have been arrested by their scent, as well as by their colour. And as we know, this year, after a very late spring, the impact of such sensory experience is the greater if delayed by long months of cold and wet. Maud Monaghan narrates, that as a child, Janet enjoyed Greek myths and had poetic feelings about a playmate who had nearly drowned when they were children at Cottesmore to be saved by the water lilies. She would certainly have known the myth of Hyacinth, murdered by a jealous god, only to be resurrected in the form of this sweetly scented and deeply coloured harbinger of spring. So I think somewhere in her cultural unconscious were these stories of Greek myths, resurrection, new life, as she looked at the hyacinths. <coughs> but the main thing that happened as she came to the flower bed in the park was what she described later as a moment outside time. Then the word of God came to me and I saw it all. And Maud Monaghan attaches an extract from one of Janet Stewart's later plays, in which the protagonist has a similar experience and explains, it was all gathered into a light, a balance. What is this and what is that? The whole world was on one side, all that was best in it, and God on the other. And my heart told me, if thou wilt have one, thou must give the other. And I saw that all life was to be seeking and all death to be finding. Now there are suggestions here of um, the exercises, but with which by the time Janet was writing plays for the novices, 
she was very familiar. Ignatius writes about how a retreatant might make her election or her life decision. I should be as though at the centre of a pair of scales, a balance, ready to follow any direction I sense to be more to the glory and praise of God and the salvation of my soul. And of course, Ignatius sees three different ways in which this, this election might be made. One of them is very rational. You have all the reasons down one and all the reasons against on the other side. But he also has, um, in what he calls the first time, he describes a more visionary experience where God, as with St. Paul, cuts to the chase and um, the, will, the will is moved and attracted immediately, uh, directly by the Holy Spirit. And I think it's almost that Janet has had some sort of moment of that sort as she looks at the hyacinth uh, flowers. At any, at any rate, it was evidently a critical moment and a critical choice. What is interesting, in view of the fact that she was in such close touch with the helpers, is that her choice fell, finally, on the society. She wasn't a, an associate of the society. Now, the fact that Father Galway preached at retreats for the ladies at Roehampton will have some, something to do with that. It was under his rectorship, too, at Farm Street, that the Sacred Heart Chapel was dedicated, and a new Sacred Heart aisle completed. And if you have time to visit Farm Street, uh, if you're in London, the, the church there, you can see them. They're, I think they're exquisitely beautiful. I really do. Um, and the Sacred Heart Isle was completed just before Janet was received into the church there in 1879. Galway had hoped for a convent for Janet where she could see a grand view, um, I quote, and always have her heart lifted to rejoice in God's creation. Now I'm not sure, uh, with apologies to Susie, I'm not sure that the, what are now the Digby Stewart grands quite provided that view, even then. Froebel College has a much more beautiful view over Richmond Park. But the Roehampton Convent was at the time a gracious house set in an attractive, semi-rural landscape that would have felt like home in many ways to Janet. But I think much more interesting things may have been going on too in her choice of the society. The heart was important to Janet. Her preferred way of praying, as she had written to Galway, was with her heart, more than with her mind. She had a gift for relationships and deep feelings for people and for nature, as we have seen. She was attracted to heartfelt contemplation as well as to intellectual pursuits, and she loved teaching. She really did love teaching. Devotion to the Sacred Heart, though she probably had experienced very little of it as a convert, was becoming popular and widespread in the mid-19th century. And the newly dedicated altar and aisle at Farm Street is just one symptom of that. Although the prospect of enclosure would have been costly for her, and was, the society's contemplative and relational spirituality would have been attractive. Then there was its global reach and the possibility that she might be asked to work overseas. We know from her own words that she was interested in the idea of being a missionary and possibly inspired by Eugenie Smet's sisters who worked in the Crimea among other places. Um, had shared with Father Galway an attraction to this life. And he sympathises with this, and there's a lovely bit that is quoted in Maud Monaghan, where he says, he's warning her not to take too many risks when she's hunting. Um, and he says, it would not be at all a proper finale for you to die while hunting. If the savages were to kill and eat you as a Christian, I shouldn't mind. <laughs> But I do ambition for you, some fate better than a huntress with broken bones. 
And later, um, when she's writing to her first spiritual director um, as, as vicar, Father, Father Daniel, who was also a Jesuit, um, he was a, a missionary in the Zambezi region um, on the borders of Zimbabwe and South Africa. Um, and she was fascinated by his work and she took great interest in all the details and she even designed uniforms for the children at his schools. <laughs> um, and she, I would be interested to know from the Irish sisters here if anyone knows a little bit more about a school that she founded in Armagh to um, educate young girls. I mean, it's shameful now, we would, this is terrible, but anyway, it was what they did at the time. Uh, to educate the young daughters of relatively poor people, uh, preparing them to go out on the missions. Um, it was a kind of female seminary. Um, and I don't know what became of that school, if anybody knows anything about it, but we'll hold it over for another time. Anyhow, it shows her interest in, in um, more global outreach of some kind. But perhaps, too, her choice of the society, with its charism of glorifying the heart of Jesus and making it known through the means primarily of education, also reflected a positive step in her private struggle with grief and bereavement. The focus of the helpers at that time was on doing good in this life to, to help souls out of purgatory. That was how they expressed it then. The focus of the society was on personal relationship with the heart of Jesus in order to win people while still alive to know his love for them. So there could be a positive movement in her own um, spiritual search at that time. Very speculative, but that's what I propose. Of course, Janet's understanding of her vocation and her relationship with the charism and spirituality of the society grew and changed over time. We get insight into how she had learned to understand it towards the end of her life from her book, The Society of the Sacred Heart, which does bear, some chapters at least, bear rereading. It was, as you know, written on the boat to Australia in 1913, and it drew on prayer and experience of her lifetime. In the chapters on training and devotion to the Sacred Heart, the aspects she celebrates of our spirituality are the emphasis as she has understood it, on being oneself, on being true to one's own individuality, and on focusing on the true spirit rather than the letter of the law. These chapters are also and mainly interesting, however, because they focus attention on the lesser known at the time of two versions of the devotion to the Sacred Heart. She gives due acknowledgement to the popularized devotion of Margaret Mary Alacoc with its emphasis on the passion and death of Christ and the call to reparation. And you remember in my previous talk, I mentioned how she had this extraordinary image of the person who prays as the mother of the motherless God, <laughs> which is an ex it's still, it just, is amazing, whatever you make of it. Um, so the call to, that is part of reparation, I think, consoling an unconsolable child or, or a child that needs consoling. But in this book, she doesn't highlight that aspect. Instead, she focuses on the spirit of the office and mass that Sophie Barra had received permission to substitute for it, for the, for the other one. And this is the Egredimini, I don't know if I pronounced that right, office and mass emanating from St. John Hughes, which focuses on the love of Christ as manifested in his whole life on earth. The inward life of the Sacred Heart, I'm quoting Janet Stewart now, with all its expression of itself, its tenderness, no dispossession of the soul lies outside it. 
According to Janet, we want to respond to his love with our own love because it speaks to our whole lives, not just because of the pain and suffering of its final hours. And I'm very grateful to Mary Grant. It's a pity she can't be here, but she's helped me with this and did quite a bit of the um, research, getting the, the details of this Mass for me. The readings and scriptural references of the Egridimini Mass are, frankly, sunny, warm. Its introit invites the Daughters of Zion to celebrate a king's coronation on the day of his heart's joy. And I think it, we might also notice um, that the focus of this prayer and of others is firmly on the experience of women rejoicing, the Daughters of Zion. The other masses don't have that in it at all, in them at all. The Gospel is John 15, the vine and its branches. And the offertory prayer begins, Lord God, joyfully and with sincere heart, I offer all to you. And we are reminded at the communion antiphon that God's mercy is everlasting. So the focus is on joy and rejoicing, on affirmation of love and life, and on putting on the mind and heart of Christ, putting one's own life into the shared yoke of one who is gentle and humble. And that's quoting um, from, I'm sorry, it's not quoting from this. Part of it is quoting from Janet Stewart herself. Part of it is me. <laughs> this meditative, imitative, penetrating, inward manner of devotion, quote, which imposes no set form and admits of endless diversity of assimilation, is what, in 1913, Janet identifies and loves as the characteristic spirituality of the society, played out in varieties of ways in the different characters of individuals and individual communities. The one thing necessary, she wrote in a conference to the Roehampton community on December the 31st, 1909, is our individual, personal hold on God and our relationship with him. A relationship founded in the balance, that word again, of faith, hope and love, which is rooted in profound belief that the one who prays is herself loved. And she continues, fidelity to the rule is fidelity to this personal relationship. We work hard, she told the communities in Melbourne and Timaru in December and January 1913-14, to 14. but this work is not our telos. Our energy for work should come from the overflow of prayer which has resulted in identification with God's own love and sympathy, as shown in the heart and mind of Christ, which, in prayer, we have put on. Remember how much you are to God, she says to the Roehampton community in her last conference to them, and what he thinks of your value. Dwell on the extraordinary greatness of our destiny, we come from God, and we go to God. God is our end, our telos. Dwell on this. God will only have gods for his sons and daughters. We can never exhaust the possibilities of our vocation. Perhaps it was all this, intuitively, that she saw in her hyacinth moment unconsciously, probably.